Welcome to Right on the Money, the weekly talk show with interviews you can use to help you maximize your money and optimize your financial future. Before moving forward with any of the ideas discussed on the show, always consult your financial advisor, insurance professional, or tax consultant. Looking for financial help or a second opinion? We can help you in your search. And now, your host of Right on the Money, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator, Steve Savant. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and our book review on Return on Principle with best-selling author, popular platform speaker, and talk show host of the Income Generation, David Scranton, certified financial planner. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial economist and money color commentator. And in this segment, David's talking about investor characteristics like honesty and fearlessness. I, I think I'm a pretty honest guy, David. I don't know how fearless I am. I, I don't know about that. I have apprehensions. I have trepidation, right? I have normal phobias that the normal guy has, right? Mm -hmm. So well, I'd like to be, I think I'm honest. I think people are not honest with themselves. We live in some a little bit of a mini you know, self-delusion. Mm -hmm. We need to come out of that, right? Mm -hmm. And face these things. But if we can get to honesty, maybe we can get to fearlessness. Let's talk about taking two components at the same time. Why is That's honesty... Well in your book. Why are you so big on this? Because not only does an investor need to be brutally honest with him or herself, but a financial advisor needs to be brutally honest with him or herself also. Mm -hmm. and, and bottom line is, like you said, you can be fearless if you're honest with yourself and you know whether you're the defensive coordinator. I have a lot of people, mm -hmm. do-it-yourself clients, that I say, you know, if I were to build a football team, I'd want you as an offensive coordinator. But I got to be honest with you, you'd make a really crappy defensive coordinator, mm -hmm. you know, and they laugh and they know that about themselves uh, over protection. Next, detail orientation. Uh, if you're honest about whether you like details or not. Diligence, same thing. You know, when your best buddy calls when you're retired and says, hey, it's beautiful out, let's go play golf. But, you know, today's the day that you've got to check your portfolio. Are you really going to say no to golf? If you really mm -hmm. love what you do and you love following your money, maybe you will. And if you don't, that's okay, but know thyself. Okay? Well, well, know yourself. I'm thinking of Shakespeare's great line, to thy yeah. own self be true. And I'm thinking of mm -hmm. what Sister Lucette said to me at St. Vincent's when I was nine. She goes, if you don't discipline yourself, someone else will do it for you. That's right. So I want to come under. I don't want to keep getting disciplined by the market or other people that don't know what they're talking about, like former advisors. I really want to be able to yeah. discipline and under get, get a view, mm -hmm. an honest view of how I read money. And is that a good view? And then I want to know, okay, now that I've laid the foundation, I know what's going on, I can be a little bit of fearless. I don't have to be sitting there biting my nails every time there's a market drop. I mean, the traffic we got on the Brexit drop, mm -hmm. which only lasted, what, a two or three days? Mm -hmm. And then we hit new numbers. But everybody over the weekend was having a panic attack. That's right. That's right. And so sense of overprotection is where it starts. All the other core values we were just listing through between detail orientation, diligence, uh, and then we talked just recently about coachability and, and leadership. All those come into play. And, but, okay, let's say we get past that part where the person's brutally honest with themselves. Then the question is, is the advisor brutally honest with him or herself? Now, I know when I went through that procedure recently that we all go through once we turn 50, mm -hmm. right? The, the polyps procedure, I will call it. Once we go through that, uh, you know, doctors have to be honest with themselves. My primary care physician can't say, well, sure, Dave, I'll do the colonoscopy for you because I, I've, I did one of those when I had my residency 35 years ago, so let me do it and I'll charge you a little less. He can't do that. He took a Hippocratic Oath. What most people don't realize is financial advisors, in many cases, don't take that Hippocratic Oath. The reality of it is they can try to be all things to all people. They don't have an obligation necessarily to refer you somewhere else. And that's why the questions in the book are so important because these questions are designed to really push that advisor back up on his heels mm -hmm. so that you find out not, not just what he says is his mm -hmm. specialty in his area of expertise, but you truly find out that specialty in that area of expertise. Because I, you know, I tell you what, the Department of Labor may have the last call on this in April 2017. It could, and it could be the best thing that happened to our industry in and, some ways. And I don't want to say this is my favorite part of, my, of your book, David, but maybe this is the area where most pragmatic, because I can go through this now and arm myself with the proper questions to ask because I'm of the ilk, mm -hmm. I can be honest, I just need to know is the other guy across the table honest? That's right. You know, if I can feel the the, the, the good vibe, if I can feel you, bro, as they say, <laughs> I then I can feel a little more comfortable. So when I'm looking at this, one of my favorite parts is this pragmatic walk through the diligence, you know, I am I detail. I'm like, well, okay, maybe I'm not. And mm -hmm. you know, am I a center? No, I'm not is my advisor. And if he's not, if he's outsourcing it, I want to know who that is and what's their R and D work. Right. How do they come to their of determination? Course, yes. 
you deserve to know and you shouldn't be shy asking those questions. So if, if, if your advisor follows all these principles, you know, what you'll find is that one can live a fearless life. And here's the thing, you've worked hard all your life and you deserve to be fearless in retirement. You don't deserve to sit there and be afraid every time you're spending money on a trip or on dinner out, whatever it might be. You know, I get people who come in who are very left brain, very mathematical, who say, well, Dave, I want to build a financial plan that says I'm going to run out of money at 90 or 95 because, gosh, by the time I'm 90 or 95, I might be drooling all over myself. I'm not really going to worry about that. Well, I tell people they need to go to another financial advisor. I won't work with them. And the reason for that is quite simple. People don't understand that it's not about the, the, the day before they turn age 90 and they have their birthday and boom, one day they had money and the next day they're out of money. But instead, what it really is about is all the fear and trepidation as you turn 70 and mm -hmm. you turn 80 and you think, oh my goodness, as Yogi Berra said, you know, if, if I knew I was gonna live this long, I might've taken better care of myself. So mm -hmm. people say, if I'd known I'd live this long, maybe I would've taken better care of my money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the left brain side of this book, the mathematical side is all about being able to retire off interest and dividends, not touch your principal. And you've said that many times mm -hmm. today and I, I'm appreciative of that because that's the core. But the right brain side of it says, if you have those seven, those six characteristics right through up to and including honesty, then number seven becomes a layup. You can live a fearless retirement if you put yourself in that situation where you're doing what your parents told you since you were a little child. You're living off your interest. You're not spending mm -hmm. principal. Well, now, because of the sequence of returns or draw, we know, let's just be, be the honesty. We're going into confession. We might as well get the whole thing out. That's right. We're not doing that right now. And our principle of our portfolio is dropping. It is. Just Americans are talking about this all the time. Every time we do a sequence of return show, everybody says I'm, I'm the guilty of it. All right. Yeah. Can I, in the middle of my heresy, change and get back on track, though? I mean, if someone's an investor or, do, or we're an advisor? Doing, we're doing this ourselves. We're, we've been taking out too much money. We're pilfering our portfolio to get the job done. Can I return to your interest and earnings only mentality to leave my portfolio in its wholeness? Well, the timing is crucial right now. So if you asked me this question several years ago, I'd say no, because you're underwater. You lost 50%, but you didn't make that 100% to recover. But now with the markets at a record high, the reality is that where we are today has been unprecedented. We have the U.S. Federal Reserve that stopped quantitative easing at the end of 2014. Draghi came out recently and said that after March of 17, he may stop quantitative easing in Europe. The reality of it is we're trying to raise short-term interest rates at the Federal Reserve, although it's been nearly impossible. I can't think of a better time to take some of your winnings off the table right now and lock in those gains because you don't, you never, you never really get those gains until you take the winnings off the table and you lock them in. And I think that's the most important lesson. So the timing is good. And yes, if you do it now, absolutely. If you wait till that third drop starts, mm -hmm. which could happen a year from now or a month from now or a week from now, we don't know, then it could be too late. And, and your listeners, my viewers have to realize that the first time the market dropped and recovered, it actually took seven years to drop and come back. The second time it took six. Well, there's no law or rule which says it couldn't take 10 years. And even if you're younger, that means 10 years of zero gain on your portfolio. Steve, mm -hmm. I don't care if you're 25 years old, you don't want to have zero return Listen, for 10 years. Listen, we had millennials and, or I should say Gen Xers, get just start their practice they're in the business, they're in their 20s, and they open up the year 2001, two and three with market losses. Yeah. Just about the time they think they're recovered, they get 2008. So the first 10 years, known as the lost decade, many young people have got zero for 10 years. Zero or yeah. negative, right? And they were just told, write it out. The good news about the young generation today is they're lucky because their earliest paradigm in the investment market is different from the baby boomers. It's be careful about the markets because the markets are fickle. That's a good paradigm mm -hmm. to have. It's us baby boomers that have really gotten stuck where, where our mm -hmm. paradigm became, oh, cross your fingers and toes and hope for growth because mm -hmm. you always get growth. Mm -hmm. so, so at least the younger generation has, has learned the hard way mm -hmm. early on when the stakes are smaller. The problem with most income generation members is right now the stakes are simply too large to gamble. I noticed you use a combination though of income annuities and interest and equity earnings kind of in a combination plate to kind of get the best of both worlds. Most times I see a digest, either you're one side or the other, but not two. Mm -hmm. You're one of the few that homogenize and actually make this integration work. To steal one of your savant-ism, Steve, 
you know, I am agnostic as to which combination of income generating non-stock market alternatives people use. In fact, in my process and the process of all of our financial advisors that are part of my national study group together, we all do the same thing. You know, once somebody says they don't want to have a majority of their money in the stock market and they want to be reasonably conservative, we then take time to invest, we invest time in them as a new client uh, so that they can learn about this universe of options. And together we mm -hmm. custom build a portfolio of income generating options with which they're comfortable. Because that's how custom is built. Custom isn't built cookie cutter, it's built by having the input from the actual investor. Well, that's all the time we have for our show this week. I want to thank David Scranton for being our very special guest. And before I go, I want to remind you of what the good Reverend John Wesley once said. Make all you can, give all you can, save all you can. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you next week right here on Right on the Money. For more information on this week's money topics, just go to our website at www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and follow Steve's daily postings on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. When it comes to retirement, money management, small business, insurance coverage, college funding, or budgeting, we have the interviews you can use.